<laughs> Thank you, sir. Very nice to be here again this afternoon after having such a wonderful time this morning and fellowshipping around the Word of the Lord. We are happy for a visit back again with you fine people here in, <clears throat> in the prairie. And this morning we were speaking on the subject of achievement and God's provided way. And I was telling the ones that was in the class this morning that men are trying to achieve something for themselves, always. Something that they can say, I did this or I did that. And we was talking of the subject of how wonderful it would be, how the news would flash all over the world in a few moments if people could find a way to control the rain, to put it on the crops or take it off the crops. Or how that if they could find a medicine somewhere would cause an old man to return young and a woman back young and live forever. Why they would they would send news everywhere. They're trying to achieve that, but it's already been achieved. Christ has did this for us. And he is God's achievement for us. And we must believe him. Now these services are not to be, sometimes they're called divine healing services. Now, I do not believe that there is any man who can heal people. I believe that healing is done by faith in Christ, like salvation. There is no one could forgive our sins. They're already forgiven. Christ saved the world from sin when he died at Calvary. It will never do you any good except you receive it as your own personal benefit. And that's the way it is by healing. All that God could do for the sick and afflicted, he did it when he died at Calvary. And now he purchased that for us. That was his achievement. Now, but to receive it, we have to accept it as our own personal uh, property, salvation. I might ask today, how many of you people were saved ten years ago? Many hands would go up. How many were saved last year? Hands would go up. But you see, you was not saved ten years ago or last year. You were saved 1,900 years ago. You accepted it ten years ago or, or whenever you did. Now, it's already a finished work. The Bible said he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. See, it's a past tense, something that has been done. So simple. And yet, divine healing is one of the great masterpieces of the Bible. The masterpieces of uh, God that was given to the Christian church that's been long forgotten long ago. But it's something that belongs to us. It's something that's your personal property. And now to say that it isn't so... They've come too late for that. But I've taken about seven trips around the world, and I've seen it in every nation. Tens of thousands of blind, deaf, dumb, afflicted, cancers, tumors, leprosy, and even being dead, and doctor's statements written out, been dead for hours and raised back to life again. So, now those just can't be just statements. We wouldn't accept it like that. The doctor has to say so. See, it has to be an authentic statement before we can publish it. And it's tens of thousands that's never been published because I'm not very much on publishing things unless it's just among ourselves. Jesus said in one place, don't tell anybody about it. Just go ahead and give glory to God. So I think today we put too much uh, uh, emphasis on publications and something that's uh, show off. But Christ is not a show off. He's the Son of God, humble. How can man believe unless it were ordained to believe? There were many people in his days who did not believe it. But he came to those who did believe it. Some time ago, a man said to me, was reading an article, and said the, about a little baby down in Mexico who had died in the meeting, or died that morning at about 9 o'clock, and this was 11 that night. And the doctor signed the statement that he pronounced the baby dead, at 9 o'clock that morning, at 11 o'clock that night, it was alive. I prayed for it there after seeing a vision and prayed and laid hands on the little baby before about a, all 50 or 75,000 people. 
And the little baby began kicking and screaming and come to life as, as alive today, so far as I know. The doctor signed a statement by it. And so uh, that's about five times that I've seen such done. And so the man said to me, I am going to look this up to see if that's right. I said, I saved you the trouble. Here's the doctor's statement. He said, if, if you could raise up, if, the, if you go and pray for thousands and they'd raise up from the dead or, and the cancer said, I still do not believe it. I said, certainly not. It isn't for unbelievers. It's just for those who believe. That, that's right. And, uh, he can only deal with those who believe. And there's only one unbelief. Let's keep that in our mind. There's only one sin. Not drinking, gambling, committing adultery, using profanity. That isn't sin. That's the attributes of unbelief. Jesus said, He that believeth not is condemned already. In the days of our Lord, He found many men who lived holy lives, clean, respectable gentlemen. And they were scholars, masterpieces of scholarship. And yet he said to them, you are of your father, the devil, because they did not believe him. See, the message they did not believe, that made them unbelievers. He could not help them. In his own country, there was many he could not help because of unbelief. So he could not save you in unbelief. Neither can he heal you in unbelief. You, it's just as simple as just believe it. Now, before you can believe anything... You have to have some kind of a conception of what you are believing and why. I do not believe that God heals people just to show His power to heal. I believe He heals people to show that He fulfills His Word and keeps His promises. When He came on earth the first time, He said that He did this that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet. All God's Word must be fulfilled. All of it. When Jesus died at Calvary, we know his soul went to hell. His body went to the grave. His spirit went to God. At Calvary, he said, Into thy hands I command my spirit. And his spirit went to God the Father, into his hands. The Bible said his soul, he went to hell and preached to the the, the ones who's in prison that repented not in the long suffering of the days of Noah. His body, we know, they put away in a grave and sealed it with a, with a rock. Great stone was rolled up and sealed. Then Jesus, His self, His spirit, which each of you are, that was the spirit of God in Him. But behind a bar like this, the word of God waiting to be fulfilled, He could not rise until the third day. Because David had said, I'll not leave his soul in hell, neither do I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. We all know that corruption sets in the human body in 72 hours. Now, he knew sometime within that 72 hours that he must raise up from the dead. For he said to them, destroy this body. I'll raise it up again in three days. Tear it, destroy this temple. I'll rise it up, raise it up in three days. Now, see, to hold and to fulfill the Word of God... He was behind the Word of God with a promise until them complete three days was fulfilled. After the third day, the wall was taken down. On that morning when the time was fulfilled, His Spirit descending from God came down to the grave, raised up His body, broke the seals of death, hell, and the grave, and rose up alive forevermore. Now, He is alive today. Soul, body, and spirit. He is alive. That's the theme of our conventions always, is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, on the basis of this, and I would not want anyone to say, Brother Branham, a divine healer, because I do not believe there's such. I do believe that Christ is the healer, and I believe that he has healed us. With his stripes, we were healed. And many times... There's no doubt we have a mixture here in this little church this afternoon, probably of all different denominations. Some or many different denominations, I should say. Many of them, perhaps, has been taught against divine healing. And many times, man who teaches against it, not knowing what they are doing, yet they, have, they draw the wrong conception because it's been misrepresented. Sometimes the truth can be misrepresented and just the truth ruined. 
But divine healing is correct. It's God's Word. So therefore, we must base our faith upon His Word. See? Now there's... And then, uh, it's something that has been done. Something that Christ has already did for us. Now, remember, we believe this. That God's Word must be fulfilled. That it's... God is infinite Himself. He's infallible. He is... Omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent, and infinite. If he isn't, then he isn't God. And if he is that, then he knows the end from the beginning. Before there was a world, he knew we'd be assembled here this afternoon. If he's infinite. He knows what you're thinking about in your heart before the world ever started. He knew what you'd be thinking about at this moment. He knew whatever gnat would be on the earth, every time it would bat its eyes. That's what infinite means. And if he isn't infinite, then he isn't God. See? So we must remember that we're not dealing with something in, in time and space like we are, finite. We're dealing with something that's infinite. And if this is the Word of God, then it's just as infinite as God is infinite. See? There you are. You must have faith in the Word. That's the only way it'll work. And God's Word is a seed. And you farmers here, you know if you put a seed in the ground and take care of it right, if it's in the right kind of ground, it'll produce what the seed is. And God's Word is a seed. And if you put it in the right kind of ground of faith and treat it right, it'll produce just what it is. If it's for healing, it'll produce healing. Salvation, salvation. Joy, joy. And every promise in the Bible is true. And just remember, you can take me to record for this, that the right mental attitude towards any divine promise of God will bring it to pass. If you can take the right attitude towards that promise. Now, the Bible said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Then if the Word was God, then it is still God. Now, no man is better than his word. If you can't take my word, then I, I would never be a, uh, could be a friend to you. And if I couldn't take your word, I could not trust you. But when we can take one another at our word, believing us, now that's why you do God. And no man's better than his word. If you make a promise, you should always keep it or tell the reason why you can't let them know. Because a man's word is his bond. And God's Word is His bond. If God doesn't keep His Word, then it isn't the Word of God. But if He does keep His Word, then He's God in His Word. God is still in His Word. And when His Word comes in you, then your Word becomes His Word. That's what brings it to pass, whatever you ask. Just as simple as that. God is a Creator. God created everything. All good things come from God. And wrong things, evil things, is the right thing perverted. Now, Satan cannot create. Therefore, Satan cannot heal. And there's not a medicine in the world that can heal you. No doctor will tell you that he has a medicine that will heal you. And I might say this, we're not against doctors. We're thankful for doctors and for their medicine. But we're living in the day when we got the best doctors we ever had. The best medicine we ever had, the best hospitals we ever had, and more sickness than we ever had, because we got more unbelief than we ever had. That's just the, the story of it. I've been interviewed by John Hopkins, Mayo Brothers, and you know how ministry like this goes about. And Jimmy Mayo and them, they said, we do not profess to be healers, Brother Brown. We profess to assist nature. There's one healer that is God. He said, we can move a tooth, but who will heal a place where it come out of? We can move an appendix. But who heals? Something has to create. Here, if I cut my hand this afternoon and we haven't got a medicine in all medical science to heal that knife cut in my hand. Not a one. Why you say, yes, we have, Brother Bram. Wait, tell me what it is. Many people die with knife cuts. <laughs> tell me what the healing is. Well, you'd say... Uh, well, they put penicillin in it. Penicillin doesn't heal. It just keeps clean while God heals. 
Well, you say, well, any, knife, any medicine would heal a knife cut in my hand would heal a knife cut in my coat. It would heal a knife cut on this desk. Well, you'd say, Brother Branham, medicine wasn't made for your coat or your desk. It was made for your body. Well, perhaps then I'd cut my hand this afternoon and fall down dead. And you'd take me down here to the morgue and uh, the undertaker's establishment. And there they would embalm my body with a fluid would make me look natural for 50 years. You give me a shot of penicillin every day. That the best doctors come from England, Germany, wherever they may, and doctor me for 50 years. That knife cut will be just exactly like it was cut the very first day. Now, if medicine's made to heal the human body, why does it not heal it? See? Then medicine was not made to heal human body or nothing. Now, you say, well, Brother Brenham, the life's gone out of your body. Now we're on the line. Now, which is the healer then, medicine or life? And you tell me what life is. I'll show you what God is. See? Because God is life. See? Medicine does not develop cells. If I broke my arm out here working on my car, and I ran down here at the doctor, which would be the logical thing to do, and say, now, but this would not be logical. I'd say, doctor, say, heal my arm right quick, sir. I got to finish my car this afternoon. He would look at me and say, what did you say, Mr. Branham? Heal my arm, sir. You're a healer, aren't you? Heal my arm so that I might... Uh, fix my car. Why, he'd say, you need mental healing. And that would be true. See? He could not heal my arm. But he could set it where God could heal it. He cannot produce calcium and, and life to knit that bone together. Therefore, the doctor, with his understanding, sets the bone in place, but God does the healing. See? Psalms 103, 3 said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all of thine iniquity, who healeth all of thy diseases. So the word of God can never fail. God is the healer. You must, we must always bear that in mind. God is the healer. And now unto us in this hour, just before the approaching of our Lord Jesus, and as I said this morning, my purpose here was on a little vacation. Some of the brethren is going to take me up here and go fishing after the services is over and go hunting. I've been on the field six months now without rest, worn out, tired. And perhaps now right away I'll be leaving for overseas again. And now, coming through here, after I visit you once, I thought it would not be nice to pass through this fine bunch of people here and not try to honor our Lord and to enjoy your fellowship and to do what we could to put our things together to look at our Lord Jesus again in our midst. So that's why I'm here for these three nights or three days is to fellowship with you around Christ and with my brethren here, around the things of Christ. And now it could be a great thing happen here if we'll just put our mind on God's Word and God's promise. Have faith. You man here that's married, why did you marry your wife? You had confidence and faith that she'd make a real wife and mother and so forth. Women, back to your husbands the same way. Sweethearts are thinking of marriage. You're studying the man you're married or the girl you're married. You must have faith in them or you better not marry them. Well, that's the same way it is about Christ. We are here studying and we must have faith in what we're coming for. Because remember, all redemptive blessings has already been purchased. Can we believe that with all of our heart? That all the redemptive blessings was purchased. God achieved that for us to Calvary with Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the Father, it is finished. What is finished? The whole plan of salvation. Everything is finished. All the promises that are made. The, the deposit is put before God that all sins are forgiven and we're back from the slave market. And all has been redeemed. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace upon Him and with His stripes we were healed. It's all finished. Now, I want to approach the Word for a few moments. And before we do that, Let's approach the author of the word as we bow our heads for prayer. 
most gracious and glorious Holy Father, the Almighty God, who brought again the Lord Jesus from the dead, raised him up and has presented him to us, a live being, the Son of God, and for 1,900 years has walked with his people on the earth. We are so glad today in this great tragic time when we are told that they have found from the researches missiles that will blow the earth to pieces and most every nation has them. Knowing that that exactly fits the word of God for this last day. Then we see the those things and nations, sinful nations, ungodly nations, has those weapons. Most any time there could be an explosion or in the radar there could be caught missiles coming from a certain nation, then they'll all turn their missiles loose. The world could not survive it. Then we know that could happen before morning. But before this comes to pass, we are told that Jesus will come to receive his people. For he said, as it was in the days of Noah, just before the destruction of the world, Noah went in the ark before the rain fell. And as it was in the days of Lot, the angel said, hasten, come quickly. Come out of here, for I can do nothing till thou hast come hence. And Lot went out of Sodom, and then the fire fell. And Sodom was completely destroyed, and today lays in the bottom of the Dead Sea. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And then if we can see, and science says that it is three minutes until midnight, that the world cannot survive these hours that we're facing. And we know it could happen at any time. Then how close is the coming of our Lord? Oh God, these three services coming up, we pray that you'll shake this little prairie like it's never been shaken before. Grant that every church will have a revival here through the prairie. Many of these precious people, these Scandinavians and what more out through these prairies here will be brought to Christ. That when Jesus does appear that the graves will open and we shall come out and go in to meet him and be with him forever. For what more have we in earth to look for but his coming? Now, Father, commit ourselves to thee this afternoon in this audience. Bless us together. And may the fellowship be great along the word of God. And when the service is closed and we stand to say the benediction and we go to our different homes, some out on the prairie and some down into the city and, and different places and back to the motels and hotels, May we say like those who came from Emmaus on that resurrection morning. When you walked with them all day and they didn't know you. You expounded the word of God to them and still they didn't know you. Many times these precious farmers and loved ones have just seen death at the door. And maybe they didn't recognize it was you that did it. Spared their lives. But they said they came from Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us? As he talked to us along the way, may we say the same. May the glorious resurrected Jesus come among us this afternoon and show us that he is still alive and loves us and meets wherever two or three are gathered together. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, I would like to read a scripture found in the book of St. John 12, 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethesda, of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. 
And then I like to take my text from Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now remember, I am quoting God's holy word. And I believe that those Greeks that day fitted their question with our desire today. They had heard about Jesus, and no one can ever hear about him unless you'd love to see him. If I could say this afternoon, how many in this building would love to see Jesus? I suppose every hand would go up. Let's see. How many would like to see Jesus? Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. I believe that everybody that ever hears of him longs to see him because he's different from anyone else. There never was a man like him and never will be one. There was something different from the philosophers of the Greek scholars of that day. There was something different from the church and the tradition of the Jews. Jesus, as far as we know, had no earthly education. The Apostle Peter, none of the great Bible philo uh, disciples had education, except the Apostle Paul. And he told us that he had to forget all he ever knowed in order to know Jesus. And then he said again, I never come to you with enticing words of man, that your faith would be built in, in other words, intellectual conceptions of man, but I come to you in the power and manifestations of the Holy Spirit that your faith would be in God. We find the Apostle Peter had not enough education to sign his own name, yet Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom. James and uh, Peter and John passing through the gate called Beautiful, they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned people, but they took heed to them knowing they had been with Jesus. So that's the thing we look for today, is to be and to associate with Jesus. And if you ever associate with Him, you'll never be the same again. That's true. You can never be the same person after once associating with Jesus. Now we talk about this great person of Christ, which was God in flesh. We, we speak of Him being such a great um, person that no one on earth never was like Him or never could be. But uh, then we wonder what happened to this person. Where is he? What become of him? Now, many times we try through, with, through unbelief to explain that his days is gone. But that will not satisfy the scriptures that said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then if your desire today is the same desire that these Greeks were, sirs, we would see Jesus, and they were granted that privilege. They got to see him. Then if we desire to see Jesus, and if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why can't we be granted that desire? I believe we can. Because he promised a little while, and the world will see me no more. Now the world there, as the brethren the scholars know, that, that the world there is from the Greek word of cosmos, which means the world are. The world will see me no more. Yet ye, the church, shall see me for I, I as a personal pronoun, I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the consummation. See, all the way. He, he, then that makes him the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then he has to be not one that just looks like it, one that uh, would be something like it, but he has to be the same. The same and attitude, the same in power, the same in everything but a, a physical uh, body. That sets at the right hand of God. His Spirit is here in us to manifest Himself and to take our own lives and make it just exactly what He is was. That's what He promised. The Holy Ghost, when He has come, He will testify of me and show you things to come. Now, we know that is true. Then, if I would say to you, Methodist brethren, this afternoon, uh, do you believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? You would say most surely, uh, uh, Brother Branham, that he is the same. I'd say to you, Baptist brethren, 
Are you a Pentecostal or to the Presbyterian or the Anglican or, or Nazarenes or Pilgrim Holiness or whatever denomination we belong to? Do you believe that? Sure, most certainly he is. We believe that he is the same yesterday and forever. Then is he the healer. What does he do today? Do you see him in your church just like he was in the days gone by? Now there's the question. You accept it from an intellectual standpoint, conception, but is he in reality the same? That's the main thing. Now the Bible said he is the same. You say up to a certain standpoint, he, not, it doesn't say to a certain place. It said he is the same. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I know that sounds very strange maybe to some of you, but I'm only quoting the Scripture. It's, I'm not responsible for, for writing it. I never wrote it. But the Holy Spirit wrote it, and He's responsible for it. only thing I know, it says that. And I must believe that. If I'm a Christian, I must believe every word of God is the truth. There must be no exceptions at all. Now, I may not have faith enough to make all these words live again, but I'd never stand in the path of somebody who did have faith to do it. If I can't walk like Enoch and not die and just take an afternoon walk and go home to God without dying, if I haven't that much faith, I'd, never, I'd be thankful to God for somebody who did have that much faith to do it. I would never say it could not be done because it's God's Word. Now, if He is the same... Then, and we desire to see Him, then we must see the same Jesus that they saw, if He remains the same. Now, that sounds logical, doesn't it? Now, let's find out what, now, if I'd say, you Methodist brethren believe that? Baptist in us, I've quoted it, yes. Well, now, the only way you say, He's in our church. He's in our church. Well, I say, that's true. I believe that. But, Let's find out the only way to be correctly about it, about to make the word true or not, which it is true, is to go back and find out what he was. And if we can find out what he was, then we'll find out what he is, then what he always will be. Is that right? Does that sound plain enough, Steve? What he was, he is. Well, now, if we would go in today to find Jesus... What type of a person would we go to and what kind of a spirit would it be if we went into our churches to find him? Let's go searching for each one and find out what we can find. Would we find a man with his collar turned around and a turban on his head or, or something like our great so-called holy man are today? Not Jesus. He dressed just like ordinary man. He went in and out among men just dressed like man were. We would not look for some intellectual scholar we have no record of a man ever attending one day in school. But what would we look for then? We would look for a Messiah, anointed one. Now, over, now I've read from St. John 12. Now, as we go along, we'll take through the Scripture, day or meeting after meeting, to show these things right. Now, we started in St. John. Let's just go back to the first of St. John. If you don't read it right here, you can at home, marking down the quotations. And let's go back now and find out what Jesus was. And if we can find out what he was, and he will prove himself to be the same today, would it make you happy? Would you all be very happy of that if it would make him the same today? Now, we have, I've stood in the foreign fields with the Koran in one hand of the Muhammad religion, which is one of the greatest in the world, and with the book of Buddha and the Bible in each in this hand, and say, somebody's got to be wrong. There's too much difference. Somebody's got to be right if there is a God. Now let's prove and see which one is right. Don't never be afraid to bring you to the Word of God to a showdown. You'll always be there. And... So just have faith in believing. Don't try to add something or take something from it. Just believe it the way it's written. It says that way. Amen. Then believe that without a shadow of doubt. And God's obligated if you truly believe it. Not make believe. Now, he won't bluff. Satan's not a bluff. He is a bluff. But if he can bluff you, he'll do it. But when you come with genuine faith, he knows where you're bluffing him. When the disciples are given power to heal the sick... Ten days later, we find him defeated on an epileptic case. 
And I'd imagine Peter saying, wait, I'll show you how I done it down at Capernaum. And the other one saying, I'll show you how I did it. And none could make this demon leave the child. But when Jesus came and the father went to see Jesus and he said, I brought him to your disciples and they could do nothing for him. And I brought him to you. He said, I can if you believe. For all things are possible to them that believe in the child and the hardest fit it ever had. Because that devil knew that he had met faith on a different level than what the apostles had. Amen. He had met a perfect faith. That's what we must have. Perfect faith to make the perfect Word of God perform perfectly. Amen. That's it. We must believe it without a shadow of doubt. Now, let's go back down to Galilee. Take a little mental trip now for about 20 minutes. Let's go to Galilee and find out what Jesus was. We know his birth and his immaculate conception and how that he was born. And John went into the wilderness the age about nine years old and praying and fasting before God. And 30 years old, he came out preaching a coming Messiah. And one day, an ordinary little man walked down the bank. But there was a sign above him, which was a Messiah sign. And John recognized it. And he said, I knew that it was him, for I seen the sign that told me in the wilderness that who he would be. Jesus baptized with John. Then we find that 40 days he was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. Then as he came out of his temptation, we find him immediately entering up on his public ministry. Now that's what we're here this afternoon, entering his public ministry. And the sick began to be healed when he prayed for them. And it caused a great stir among the churches. Who is this man? They had no answer in their, in their creeds. And they, they, was, they could not deny that a, a notable things were being done. So there was an old fisherman by the name of Andrew. And he had a brother named Simon. And Andrew tried to get Simon to go to the meeting and... Finally, Simon agreed one day to go. And when Simon came up into the presence of the Lord Jesus, I watch close. When he came to the Lord Jesus, he did not ask him if he had a, his Bachelor of Art degree yet. Or he did not ask him what organization he belonged to. He just merely walked up. Like you have, like I have. And as soon as Jesus Eyes caught him. He said, Your name is Simon. And you are the son of Jonas. And Simon was taken off of his feet. Because his father Jonas was a Pharisee, a great man. And if you have read the history, he told his son that someday the Messiah would come. And they were all looking for a Messiah. Do you know they thought John was a Messiah? Because the real true church was looking for a Messiah. And remember, He only comes to those who are looking for Him. Amen. He only saves those who believe that He can save them. Amen. He only heals those who believe that He heals them. And Simon, looking for a Messiah, had been promised for 4,000 years since in Eden. The prophets had spoke of them. They lived by the law of Moses. And Moses, and if you'd like to refer to it, Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22, his words in quotation to Israel, he said, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. It shall come to pass that whosoever not hear this prophet will be cut off amongst the people. Now, all Israel that was taught in the Word, now don't forget this class, they knew that the Messiah was to be a prophet. Now, Israel was to hear their prophets. The Bible said, God speaking to Israel, If there be one among you who is spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord God, will make myself known to him in visions, speak to him through dreams. And if what this prophet says comes to pass, then hear that prophet. Amen. But if it doesn't come to pass, don't fear that prophet because I'm not with him. Amen. But if what he says comes to pass, then you be careful. I've sent that prophet. Amen. John, then, they knew that he was a prophet. 
because he had told them what was coming. And introducing a, a Messiah. Now this Messiah was to have a sign. And that sign was a God prophet. He was not only a prophet, but he was a God prophet. He was a God of the prophets. But his Messiah sign was to do the sign of a prophet. You know, they said, let us see you do the sign of the prophet. We'll believe you. And they put the rag over his face. But here he was to the elected, to somebody who would believe. Simon, he had never saw in his life or seen. And he laid his eyes on him and said, Behold an Israelite. And whom there... No, I beg your pardon. He said, Your name is Simon, the son of Jonas. From henceforth thou shalt be called Peter. I imagine that deflated that Pharisee. When he seen that man that never looked at him or never seen him in his life, tell him who he was, what his name was, what his father was. Now, that was a sign of the Messiah. That was Jesus yesterday. That's how he made himself known to the people, as being the Messiah. Now, there was one staying there by the name of Philip. I'm still in the first chapter of St. John. One named Philip, a good man, just man. He saw this take place. And there's something about it. When you see Jesus come onto the scene... You just can't hold your peace. You've got to tell everybody about it. Amen. That is, if you love him. So Philip, oh, he was so elated. Until he said, I must go tell Nathaniel, my friend. How many of you, brethren, here might have been in Palestine? If you have marked the place where Jesus was at that time, to where Nathaniel was, it's about 15 miles around the mountain. And Philip took off around the mountain. And he found Nathaniel. And let's drama here just a minute. A little drama. I can imagine him walk up to the door and knock at the door. And Mrs. Nathaniel came to the door and he said, Where is Nathaniel? Oh, he's strolling in his orchard. I must see him at once. Back out into the orchard he goes. There he finds Nathaniel on his knees under the trees praying. Maybe, oh God, something like this perhaps. We have long and waited for that coming Messiah. We believe that you will send him someday. We, we believe that, Lord. I'll be looking for him when he comes. Amen. Now, Philip, being a Christian gentleman, he would not interrupt prayer. Of course not. He stood reverent until uh, Nathaniel got through praying. Then he raises up Nathaniel and begins to brush off his garment. And quickly, he never said, how's the crops getting along? Or the, the, the message was urgent. You must get it to him right quick. Amen. That's what it is today, brethren. The message, we haven't got time for 15 years of schooling. The Amen. message is urgent. Amen. The world's at the end. Amen. The time is at hand. These very things that you'll see through this meeting proves that the next moon is the coming of the Lord, the translation of the church. Amen. Scripture. I'm not saying that to make fear. I'm saying that is a warning to be ready. We don't know what minute he may come. Now, see what's taking place. He said, come see who we have found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Philip spoke these words to Nathaniel, and Nathaniel was a staunch orthodox, you know, so very starchy, I suppose. He said, now, something like this, wait a minute. Could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? And perhaps they might have said this. Now, if there was to be a something like that coming, well, of course, it would come through us Pharisees. Or uh, the Sadducees said it would come through our church. And if it was coming, well, of course, the corridors of heaven would open and, and the Messiah would walk right down upon the, by the temple. And he'd say, K. Ephesus, the honorable high priest, here I am. But you see, God doesn't do things that way. 
He never did do it. Amen. And He never will. Amen. He comes and takes the dumb things of the world and makes something out of it and proves Himself to fulfill His Word. Now search the Scriptures and find out if that isn't true. He takes something that's insignificant. When He called His apostles, what did He take? Fishermen. Uneducated. People. Why didn't He take the cultured? Why didn't He take the priests? They had ministers of that day that would far exceed anything that we've ever had. They had to come out of a lineage of Levites to be priests. Their great, 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 great grandfathers were priests. And why didn't he go to that type? But you see, he taken something with nothing to prove that he is God. Amen. That he can make something out of nothing. Amen. And as quick or as soon as you and I can realize that we are nothing, Amen. that's how quick God can go to work with us. Amen. When we get our intellectual conceptions out of it Amen. and just say, God, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That's it. If the Word says so, then it's true. God's behind His Word. And He's in His Word. And He is the Word. Amen. Now we notice that this staunch orthodox of, looked at Him and said, maybe something like this. Now, Philip, I've known you to be a good man. We went to church together for years. But I believe you went off on the deep end. There must be something wrong with you. You've had some kind of an illusion. You mean to tell me that a man from Galilee would be the Messiah? Is that the man that I heard that had that illegitimate birth, that baby many years ago they talked about? Black name to start with? And here you come telling me that this turns out to be the Messiah. Oh, Philip, get next to yourself. Could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? I think he gave him an answer that would stop all of us. Amen. He gave him the right answer. He said, come and see. That's it. Don't stay home and criticize. Bring your Bible and see if it's right. That's good doctrine for us. Come see. Church out the Scripture, Jesus said. For they are they which testify of me. Now, come see. I can imagine as they start along the way back to get over the next day, it's 15 miles, probably taking two days' journey. Coming back, I can imagine along the road. Let's break in on their conversation. It will not be unscriptural. So then, along the conversation, I can hear Philip say, Then Nathaniel, you cannot believe that, sir, my brother. You are a theologian. You are a man of authority in the Scripture. What readest thou of Messiah? What will Messiah be when he comes? What type of man shall we look for? Oh, said Nathaniel, he will be a prophet. Because the Bible said he will be a prophet. Our sacred Scripture says he will be a prophet. Well, do you remember that old fisherman that you bought the fish from that day named Simon? And he did not have enough education to sign his own name? Yes, I remember that well. He came up before this Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus of Nazareth told him who he was. And not only that, but told him who that godly old father of his was. And it wouldn't surprise me, but if he didn't tell you who you are. Well, I can imagine Nathaniel saying, if that be so... I don't know. I've never been there. But if that be so, that will be Messiah. Because that's what he's supposed to do. He's a prophet. And we haven't had a prophet, he says, for 400 years since we had a prophet. And we've been looking for this Messiah, which is next in line. We haven't had one for 2,000 years. Now, but we're looking for one. Now, he said, this Messiah, if he be the Messiah, then I'll see him do the sign. Then we walked up into the congregation, I suppose, and maybe he was in the prayer line or maybe he was standing out in the audience. I do not know. But however, as soon as Jesus turned and caught his eyes, he said, behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. 
Now, for instance, a critic might be present. They say, well, sure, he was dressed like it. Oh, no. The Easterners all dress alike. They have a long robe and underneath garment and a turban and wear a beard. So it was, it couldn't have told him it could have been a Greek or anything else. He said, behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. I can imagine the starts going out of him right quick. And he said, Rabbi, which means teacher, when did you ever know me? This is the first time that we've ever met. And how did you know that I was an Israelite, a man with no God? Listen. He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. What eyes. What did this staunch believer who know the Scripture say? Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus said, because I told you that, you believe, you shall see greater things now. Amen. Now, that was Jesus yesterday. How he made himself known to the people as Messiah. If Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that's the way he would be today, if he is the same. Is that true? Amen. Have to be. Now, there's many other quotations we could make, but the, I know we don't have it, about 45 more minutes. And I'll catch it on through the Scripture. But I'd like to go to about, let's say this. There is three races of people on earth. I know you say I'm this, that, or the other, but there's only three races. We all sprang from the sons of Noah. Scripture is right. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Now, that turned out to be in his day, Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Now we find out that there was a race of people called the Samaritan, which is half Jew and Gentile, and they were looking for a Messiah. They wanted to see Messiah. Now remember, there was those standing there who saw Jesus do that. You know what they said? They were great preachers, great teachers, orthodox, and their belief. But they said, this man is Beelzebub. He's a fortune teller. What did Jesus say to them? They didn't say it out loud, but he perceived their thoughts. We all know that scripture. He perceived their thoughts. And he turned to them. And he said, I forgive you for that. For those evil thoughts. Calling the works of God an evil spirit doing it. A Beelzebub. A fortune teller. Today they'd call it something like that. Or telepathy. But... An evil name to the works of God. He said, but someday the Holy Ghost will come to do the same thing. Now, here's where it puts us. One word against it will never be forgiven in this world, neither in the world that is to come. That's how sacred it is. One word against it will never be forgiven in this world, nor in the world that is to come. So you see... If he is doing this, what position it puts us in? It seals us on one side or the other. The separating time has come. The investigating judgment. Now, we find many other places. We take the next chapter. Well, we first let's go. Now, there's a Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Now, not one time did he ever do that sign before a Gentile. You cannot find it in the Scriptures. Gentiles was, we Anglo-Saxons, Gentiles, we were looking for any Messiah to come. We had clubs on our backs and worshipped idols, see? Heathens, Romans, and so forth. Now, but He comes to those who are looking for Him. He did it in that day. If He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, He'll do it again today. Amen. He comes for those who are looking for Him. Those who are longing like those Greeks were. We would see Jesus. Now, He was on His road down to Jericho, which is down below the mountain, where Jerusalem is on the mountain. But He said He had need to go by Samaria. Now, of the city of Cyprus. Now we notice that Samaria sets up the road this way, go up this way, and then go down to Jericho, way out of His way. But he went up to this certain 
Samaritan city of Samaria. And he sat down and sent his disciples away to get some food. And while they were gone, there was a woman of, uh, well, ill fame, we would call her in America, here, that she was uh, a woman of ill fame. How many knows what was wrong with her? She had broke her marriage vow. She had five husbands. And maybe, let's say, she was a beautiful woman. And everyone was away. And if he was ever there, the well still stands. It's a little panoramic, something like this. And Jesus, uh, he was only 30 years old, or th- not quite 33. Uh, but yet, he must have looked older. When he was talking in St. John 6 to the Jews when they was having the feast, and they were drinking this water, representing the water from the uh, rock smitten in the wilderness. Um, he said, uh, I am that rock that was in the wilderness. Oh, they, oh, that stirred up their righteous indignation. And he said, uh, you mean to tell me that you saw Abraham and you're a man not over 50 years old? He looked 50, but he's only 30. His work probably did it to him. Maybe graying a bit or something. But what did he say to him? Before Abraham was, I am. It was Abraham's God. But there he was, just dressed in clothes like an ordinary man. So the man might have looked a little aged, but he was a Jew, and there was segregation, like we're having a fuss about down in Louisiana and Georgia. I got some Georgia friends sitting here about the segregation, colored and white and so forth. That was Jew and Samaritan. And so Jesus, seeing the woman come up, and uh, well, perhaps if he's ever in the Orient, their ch- customs never changed correctly, she couldn't have come out with a decent woman. See, they have to come out. The early virgins come out early and get their water. And I've seen them take a pot of it, the whole five gallons, set it on their head and put one on each hip and go along like that, talking just as ladies can do, you know, and never spill a drop of water. <laughs> it's amazing to watch how perfect and straight they walk with that, just talking to one another, you know, and never move that great big pot of water on their head. Two big handles on it where they let it windle it down into the well to get the water. And uh, this young woman comes out there. She perhaps carrying the pot on her hip as custom with the hook on her arm. And she was thinking maybe about what she had done the night before. She couldn't associate with the good women. So she uh, uh, started to let the pot down into the, the well. And he heard, she heard a boy saying, Bring me a drink. Woman, bring me a drink. And she turned. And sitting over by the vines against the wall, said a middle-aged Jew. Quickly, she said, it is not customary for a Jew to ask a Samaritan woman any favors. Oh, the segregation was bitter. We have no dealings one with another. And you, a Jew, and me, a Samaritan woman, how would you ask me for a drink of water? Lift up the reply. Woman... If you knew who you were talking to, oh my, that's what it is today. If you only knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink. I'd bring you water, give you water, you do not come here to draw. Or she said, the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with. And uh, the conversation went on, what was Jesus doing? Now here, you'll have to take my word, I hope you will. He was contacting her spirit. He knows there's something wrong. The Father had sent him up there. So he knows this woman was coming because he said in St. John 5, 19, Dearly, dearly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. See? Now, the Father must have sent him up there and he seen that was the woman. So he had to contact her spirit to talk to her till he found out where her trouble was. He said, uh, uh, she said, we wor- you worship at Jerusalem, and uh, in this mountain we worship. The conversation went on for quite a while. Finally, Jesus caught her trouble. Now listen. Excuse me, I'm not trying to yell at you. I've been preaching outside and so forth, and I make a lot of noise, I think. said, Duh. you have nothing to draw with, so how could you get the water? said, well, now, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I give you waters, you don't come here to drop. And the conversation went on. He said, go get your husband and come here. Oh, I can see her eyes brighten up. She said, I have no husband. What a, 
A shock that must have been. He said, Thou hast said, Well, you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. So you said it well. Listen to this prostitute, ill famed woman. She know more about God than half the preachers in the United States. She never said, You are Beelzebub, a devil. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now listen, we know, we Samaritans, we know that Christ is coming, who is called the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ, the Anointed One. See? And when He comes, this will be the sign that He'll show He'll tell us these things. You are a prophet, but we are looking for a Messiah. And when this Messiah comes, He will tell us these things. This will be His sign. Oh, church! Can you see it? That's the Messiah. That's the sign of Messiah. We know that when He comes, He'll show us these things. He never, she never said you're a Beelzebub. You must be a fortune teller. She, now that's what the preachers called him. The big up clergy in that day, the priests, they said that guy's a, a telepathy. He is a, a psychic middle. He, he is a fortune teller. Jesus said, I forgive you. But someday the Holy Ghost is coming to do that. You speak one word against us, it, it'll never be forgiven. And that day has arrived. Now, talking to another generation. Notice, she said humbly, Sir, thou must be a prophet. We know we Samaritans, we're looking for a Messiah to come. And when this Messiah comes, he'll show us a sign that he's the super prophet. See? We, we know when he comes, we, we'll know that he's a prophet because he'll do these signs. Listen at him. I am he who speaks with you. There never was a man before, never one after could say that. I am he that speaks with you. And upon that she dropped her water pot and ran into the city and said, Come see a man. Now listen, class, you Bible readers. Come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? And they went out and bid him to come into the city. And the Bible says that the man of that city, the people, believed on him because of the testimony of the woman. Amen. Could that be disputed? No, see, that's the scripture. Here. Well, if that was Jesus yesterday, it's Jesus today. Amen. Now look, we are all aware now that that was the closing of... The day for the Jews, they rejected their Messiah. We know that. Now, they were looking for a Messiah, and when the Messiah came, he was rejected. And when he'd done the sign of the Messiah, he was called an unclean spirit. Never did he do it to the other race, Gentiles. Because he was crucified, rose again, and Peter preached the message to the Cornelius house and so forth. Now, never did Jesus do it. But remember, it was promised... And God cannot break His words that it would happen to the Gentiles in the end time. And the prophet said, There will be a day that will not, cannot be called day or night. But in the evening time, it shall be light. Now we've had a day. How does the sun rise in the east? The same sun crosses the horizontal and sets in the west. Not another sun, the same sun. And when it rose in the east, it shined on the eastern people, the Samaritans and the Jews. And when he was there, he produced a sign to show that he was Messiah. Now, we've had 2,000 years of a dismal day. Something like outdoors are a little darker. We've had great revival. Walking in what dismal light we have. We've had day when we could make great organizations. 
build great churches, great schools, seminaries. That's all all right. But it's evening time now. The sun is setting. Civilization has traveled with the sun. The oldest civilizations are the east. China is the oldest civilization. And civilization has traveled with the sun. Where are we now? On the west coast. If we go one bit farther, we're back east again. We're in the evening time. It shall be like in the evening time. What is it? The same sun. Now, God is an infinite God. He's infinite, we know that. And if He, after all those years of intellectual teaching, and He'd come to the Jew and Samaritan before the end of their time and showed them the sign of the Messiah, He would not be the same God if He let us Gentiles go in on intellectual conception. He must absolutely do the same thing and He promised He'd do it to the Gentile church. Now, for the benefit of my clergy, that they might have a conception understanding, a little clearer perhaps, maybe. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, let's just watch a moment. And please, if I uh, say something here that against a, a church or something or certain denominations, I'm not meaning it in that, that light. I'm just trying to make a point. Watch Abraham. He was the father of the nation. To be. Through his royal seed, which was Christ. Now, it could not happen, the full promise to the Jews. Because through Isaac, the promise was all through the Jewish race. But in this last days, he has promised it to Abraham and his seed, which Christ was his seed. The church is his side. Now, not only to Abraham, but his seed. The Lord willing, if I get some extra hour or two, I'd like to teach you Abraham and his seed after him. Notice how he brought Abraham through those junctions of justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Spirit, just the same thing he's done the church. Exactly. Placed him as a son, and just before Sodom was destroyed... Now, keep in mind, there's three classes of people always, like Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. That's believer, make-believer, and unbeliever. So we, we find that. And every meeting produces it, every crowd produces it, we just have it. Now, look at that day. Abraham did not go down in Sodom. But Lot went down in Sodom. He was still a believer. Like the ordinary church, the ritualistic believer... Yet he was a believer, and he was down in Sodom because he thought he could make some extra money or be a little more popular. I think he'd become the mayor of the city or something down there. And um, his wife belonged to all the clubs and so forth down there, and it was hard for her to leave. But just before that taking place, now look, there was, Abraham was the elected, and we all know that Christ is coming for an elected church. That the rapture is the remnant. We know that. The elected church. The others go through the judgment. But the elected goes first in the rapture because it cannot go into the judgment. Jesus said, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. He that heareth my words and believeth on him and sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death into life. Thank John 5, 24. We are in Christ already judged. God judged us by our faith in His Son, Christ Jesus. And by the Holy Spirit, we are baptized into that body and become part of Christ. The elected church. Abraham represented the elected church just the same as the elected church of his seed after him in this day. You follow it? Abraham, not only Abraham, but his seed after him. And he was the father of nations, which here we are today. I'm Irish and some, uh, maybe Indian and some, Norwegian and some uh, others. See, we're all sitting here, but by God has made of one blood all nations. We're all one in Christ. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. 
Right. That's the elected church. Now, there is a church that does not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Out there in Sodom. They still do the things they do in Sodom. Bean cold, bunk cold, <laughs> soup suppers, all kinds of things. Dress like the world, act like the world. Still call themselves church members. See, that's the Sodom church. Now, just before the end come, now remember, the word church means called out. As separated, segregated from unbelief, believing every word of God. And look what Abraham, Abraham staggered not as a promise of God through unbelief. No matter how long it took. Oh, when, when Sarah was 65 years old and Abraham was 75, he was sterile. She was unfertile. And yet God told him he was going to have a baby with that woman. And he believed it and made arrangements for it. And 25 years later, he still believed the same thing. Yet with no evidence, he was getting farther away all the time. But the Bible said instead, you might be prayed for, so I don't see no difference in me. And then you go on back. See, that's not Abraham's seed. When Abraham's seed catches that promise, there's nothing going to move it. So stay right there. No matter. I can hear Abraham saying, uh, come in and say, Sarah. Yes, darling. I, I just met God out there. Oh, he said we're going to have a baby. Could you imagine an old man, 75 years old, an old woman, 65, going down to the doctor and make arrangements for a baby? Doctor said, there, old fellow, poor old guy, he's all. Oh, that's why everybody that's spiritual, everybody that loves God, they're considered a little bit off, you know. So, well, the old fellow let him alone, he's harmless. Well, God told Abraham, separate yourself from yeah. such. Come out. Get away from that unbelief. Yeah. Excuse me, sisters. I have to make a point here. But maybe after the first month or so many days, I can hear Abraham say, what about Sina? I remember she is about 20 years past menopause. So said, how are you feeling, darling? No different. Bless God, we're going to have it anyhow. <laughs> Get the booties made and all the little blankets and so forth. Go to have it anyhow. How do you know? God said so. That's settled. Well, a year passed. How about it, darling? No different. Glory to God to be a greater miracle than it was in the first place. Go to have it anyhow. Twenty-five years passed. Now here she's a little grandma. See? And Abraham, old and stricken. And age. Ah, oh, dear, how are you feeling now? No different. Our glory to God will have it anyhow. Amen. How do you know God said so? Amen. Now the seed of Abraham takes the same stand. Amen. God said so. And then you say, well, I was prayed for it, but I don't believe I'm any different. That ain't the seed of Abraham. No, no. The seed of Abraham believes it. I don't care what. Fifty doctors could stand and say, you're going to die. No, oh, no, go on now. How do you know? God said so. That's it. Now, notice, he was waiting. Years had passed. The beauty had faded. And she was old. And he was old. And one day, Abraham, still keeping separated, representing the seed of Abraham today, separated from the world, called out, held out. That's Christians, real believing Christians, set aside, called out. Now, Abraham's sitting up there on the hill. Things wasn't going too good. He wasn't rich. Cattle was starving. Lot was doing fine. He was down in Sodom. Mayor of the city and... Oh, he was, his wife belonged to all the clubs and they, his daughters belonged to all the societies. And I imagine they were just like Sodomites. So there they was down there in Sodom. So then, one day while Abraham sitting in the shade of the oak where his tent was pitched, he seen three men come walking. There's just something about a Christian. When you see Christ, you can recognize him. He looked at those men and he ran out to meet them. Now, he didn't look like a heathen say, My Lord. He said, My Lord, come by. Set yourself under the tree and rest. And I'll fetch a little water and I'll wash your feet. Refresh yourself and I'll get a morsel of bread for you to eat. Won't entertain them. 
Because down in his heart, he believed there was something about that. He's watching for it, you see. So they sat down, and I can see him go back to the tent, to met in the main tent. He said, Sarah, uh, sift her some flour. In other words, knead the bread. You know. And how many ever know what kneading bread was? I remember my mama used to have a big old sifter and had a big old a bin. We'd put the needle in there, and she had a wedge. She'd scrape that wedge right on top of that sifter and shake the needle through to make a cornbread. And so when she said, knead some, some meal or flour, and said, make some cakes up on the hearth. And he ran out amongst the herd and found a little calf and dressed it, give it to the man or killed it and give it to the servant to dress. And he went back out and stood before them. He brought the meat out and set it down. Now remember, they eat the meat and drink milk and eat the bread. Notice. And who did he feed that to? God. Amen. That was God. Abraham called him Elohim. You better know that. Elohim is the self-existing one. Like he began in Genesis 1. Elohim. Elohim. The great I Am. In human flesh. Eating meat. Drinking milk. Eating cornbread. And sitting under a shade tree. With dust on his clothes. Just an ordinary man. But Abraham knew that was more than a man. Two of them got up and went out to Sodom. They went out there to preach down to Sodom. Oh, if you're spiritual, you'll probably catch it. Did you notice? Them two that went down there, they did not do any miracles, only blind their eyes from the door. And preaching the gospel blinds the unbelievers' eyes. But there was a, two men went down there to preach to bring Lot out of Sodom. Look at today. Isn't it strange in this last days that all down through the age, through Abraham's seed, age, the junks of the church, we've had Moody, Sankey, Finney, Knox, Calvin, Spurgeon, Wesley, so forth. But never, and we had a Billy Sunday, but never did we ever have before a Billy Graham. Notice, the angel had changed Abram's name to Abraham. Spelled A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Giving him part of his name, Abraham, L-O-M. Because he's the father of nations also. And never has the intellectual church, down through the age, ever received a messenger that's been internationally known before with the name ending H-A-M. You heard that? Modern Billy Graham. Down in Sodom. Come out of it! That's what Billy Graham screamed. Get out of it! The end of hand. G-R-A-H-A-M. Never in the history of the church. But this is it. Watch our Lord refer to it. Then there was one angel stand up, stayed back with Abraham. Watch what kind of miracle he gave that elected church. He had his back turned to the tent. Why didn't he call him Abram? He said, Abraham. Where is thy wife? Not S-A-R-R-I, but S-A-R-A-H. Where is thy wife? Sarah. And he said, she's in the tent behind you. The Bible said that the, the tent was behind the angel, or the messenger. A messenger sitting there eating flesh, drinking milk. Said she's in the tent behind you. He said, Abraham, I, oh, personal pronoun, I am going to visit you according to the time of life as I was promised you. Now I'm just talking to a mixed audience. You young ladies, excuse me if this is an offense. But it's to make a point. Now the Bible said they were both well stricken in age as husband and wife it had ceased for years. See, they was a hundred years old. Maybe twenty years they had not been as husband and wife. And Sarah, in her heart, laughed within herself, saying, Me? An old woman? A hundred years old? Could have pleasure with my Lord, her husband, again? Why couldn't be? Those things hasn't been with us for years and years and years. 
How could it be? And she laughed within herself. And the angel said, Why did Sarah laugh? Yeah. Saying that these things cannot surely be. What did our Lord say? As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. What? The evening lights. Promised to the Gentiles. The same God that manifested Himself there in a human body and disappeared in a moment. That same God would manifest Himself in a people. Amen. The form of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A believing people in the last days of the evening light. Jesus said so. What? To the Gentiles, the seed of Abraham, which was many nations. They had their, the angel had performed the sign to the, to the church nomination. G-R-A-H-A-M. He's doing his sign. That's right. And now, the angel of God into the church elected. The angel coming from heaven. The Holy Spirit, a messenger. The proof that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did then, he does now. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And if the life that's in the branch put forth a branch, it'll bring the same life that's in the vine. And the works that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do, for I go unto the Father. The church intellectual has their messenger. The church supernatural has its messenger, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Performing and doing the very same signs that Jesus did when He was here on earth. Then, what is the light of today? Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Sirs, we would see Jesus. Then what He was yesterday, He will be today. What did He do it to the Jews and Samaritans? Not to the Gentiles, but promised in the evening time to the seed of Abraham it would be the same thing. Now, I could speak for another hour or so much on it. But one word from Him will be more than ten million I or any other minister could say. Now, we know that's true. That's the Scripture. That's the promise. But now, will He do it? That's the question. Will He do it? And what are we? We're in the evening time. We're living under the evening light. Remember, the same sun that rises in the east is the same sun that shines in the west. And the same S-U-N that rises there is the same S-U-N that goes down here. And the same S-O-N that showed light on that is the same S-O-N in the last days. To the Samaritans and to the Jews who are looking for Him, and now to the Gentiles as we are looking for Him in the evening time. God be merciful to you. I know you got to hurry home. Have your suppers and get back to church again. Remember... Search the Scriptures. Bring your papers and take down the Scriptures that I quote. If they're not right, you're, you're solemnly obligated to come to me. And show I don't want to be wrong. I'm not wrong. As long as the Scripture says it's so and God confirms it. A man can say anything he wants to. That's a man. But when God speaks, dare anybody to doubt. Amen. It's eternal separation from His presence forever. Now, what could we do? If we can realize and find out that Jesus is still alive, while we, today we go to a service, we act like we're going to a funeral service. Instead of, we're, we're going to, to pay honor to the dead. Instead of worship and hail a conqueror, Christ conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. He conquered sin. Conquered sickness. Amen. We're a failing of conqueror. Amen. Not someone died thousands of years ago and lived a good life, but a Christ that raised again and the same yesterday, today, and forever. I may be a little emotional, but if you felt the way I did, you'd be emotional too. Amen. I feel pretty religious right at this time. Amen. I know that He lives. Amen. And the Scriptures are true. 
because he lives, you can live also. Sir, we would see Jesus. Then, Lord Jesus, come into our midst. Get into our flesh. Get into my minister, brother. Into me. Into you out there. And just come. Let us surrender ourselves to you. And then you perform and show that you are a living Christ. A spirit of God that lives among us that performs and keeps your word and confirms what is promised. Let us pray now with our heads bowed. Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, the author of everlasting life and the giver of every good and perfect gift. And that most perfect gift, Lord, that we can think of was the gift that you gave us, the Son of God. And that he is alive today forevermore. And he's been with the church down through this dismal time. And now as we see in this day that the light is shining in the evening time on the western people, proving that you keep your word to the letter. And I pray, God, that every man and woman here today may receive it, believe on him. Those who do not know him as their Savior, may they... Receive him just now and say, Lord, help thou my unbelief. May those who have not yet been filled with the Spirit for service, may they say yes, that one eternal yes to the great Holy Spirit. I have read from your word today, Lord. May they be uneducated and not Sufficient, never sufficient to produce or to introduce the Scriptures. But what I lack, may the Holy Spirit make up in confirmation. Grant it, Lord. May it be so simple to the little children who will see it. All will believe. Grant that every person here that's sick might see and take notice and say, Jesus our Lord is alive. And I believe on him for my healing. And their doctors will no doubt tell them right away, there is such an improvement in you. Then down in their hearts they will know that Jesus has entered to take over the case. And they shall be well. Grant it, Lord. Bless these uh, ministers that is sitting back here on this platform. And no doubt they make up many different churches. And bless the pastor of this church. Bless its deacons, its trustees. Bless all the laity everywhere. And throughout this valley and this prairie, send a revival in every church. Send a revival to the Angulan and to the Presbyterians and to the Pentecostals and to all, Lord, that there might be a great visitation of God's Holy Spirit here in Grand Prairie that news would scatter throughout the provinces and across the nations and dominions that Jesus still lives. We long to see Him, Lord. And as our brother has well stated it this morning when he said, coming up, he's gone following signposts, looking at the sign, which way to come to Grand Prairie. It wasn't the sign that brought him here. It was the sign that pointed him to here. So may they realize today, as I have quoted the scriptures, we would see Jesus. May every person here be able to see you, Lord. In the power of your resurrection, living among us. And when we leave this afternoon, as I've quoted before, may we go home like those from Emmaus. They walked with you all day. You talked to them, expounded the scriptures. But they didn't recognize it was you. Then that evening when you made as you would go on by, and they, they constrained you that you should come in and abide with them. Oh, God made the disciples today like Theophius constrain you to come and abide with us. And when you got in their little place of the little inn, 
and you shut the doors and then you did something like you did before you were crucified. And their eyes were open. For they knew that no one did it just like that. Father, we are ministers and clergymen and messengers of the covenant. But we can't do it that way, Lord. We can't do the things that you did. But you can come and fulfill your word that, that the works that you did we would do also. Then come, Lord Jesus. And do the things like you did it before you were crucified that this Christian God-fearing people might have the assurance that our Lord is not dead, but He has arisen again. And may like Theophis and his friends go from house to house saying, Indeed, the Lord has risen. Light-footed and light-hearted. Not to argue their religion, but to say the Lord is risen. Grant it, Father. We commit ourselves, our bodies, our spirit, and all that's in us, we commit to you now, waiting to hear just one word from you. And it'll be sufficient, Father. If you'll just prove that you're living here among them, then they will believe you, Lord. These honest-hearted, dreary people, they'll believe you. And then they'll go home. They won't have to say, Brother Branham did such and such, because they know I could not. But they'll say, My Lord is alive. And I love Him and I'll worship Him and I'll tend His church and I'll, I'll do my duty as a Christian. I'll testify. I'll believe Him all the days of my life. That's the purpose that we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you love Him? All you Methodists loving, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, all loving, let's sing just one little verse. I like to worship him after chopping into the Word and so forth. Let's just worship him in the song with that good old hymn of the church, I love him. How many knows it? I love him because... Let's sing it. And let that... Don't notice who's sitting by you. Don't try to have anything I do not like as an overtrained voice. Holding their voice until their face is blue. They're not singing. They're just hollering. But I do love good old-fashioned heartfelt singing where you might not be able to carry a tune in a bucket, but yet you're singing from your heart. Now, you say, well, I'm not a singer. That doesn't matter. Make a joyful noise then to the Lord. The Scripture says so. I love Him. I love Him. We sing it again. Shake hands, you, all you different denominations and different. Shake hands with one another. Say, God bless you. Glad to be here in the worship. What am I trying to do? Get the Spirit of God moving among us. You know what we ought to do? Paul said, if I worship, I'll worship in the Spirit. If I sing, I sing in the Spirit. So let's do that both together as we slip up our hands and close our eyes real softly and sweetly in the Spirit. Let's 
bow our heads and hum it. Now the piano play it while we in our hearts worship. Oh Jesus, Son of God, Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, Morning Star. We are in the minority, Lord, when it comes to numbers of the world. But as the scripture says, we have Jesus. We do not try to compete with the world and their momentous psychological exercises. We do not try to outglitter them with ball games and intellectual entertainments. We cannot meet them, Father. You said the children of the night are wiser than the children of the day. So we know that, Father. But we have Jesus. They don't have it. And if that person be here today who doesn't have Jesus and know that they have passed from death unto life, may this be the hour that they will receive Him now as their Savior. Be filled with His Spirit, for we ask it in His name, and for His glory we pray. Amen. Don't you just love that? Oh, what fellowship, oh, what joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have perfect peace with my Lord so near, just leaning on His everlasting arms. Now, you're so nice, such a fine congregation. It's, I know God will do something for you. Now, I just ask my son, um, uh, usually we give out cards every day. The card does not make you any assurance of anything. It's just merely the whole of the card. So we, uh, I'll show you in this little congregation. How many here wants to be prayed for, whether you got a card or not? Raise up your hand. Just all over the con. Uh, who's going to be first? <laughs> there you are. See, you have to have some way to keep them in line. Now, the uh, what letter? A A one to fifty. All right. A number one to number fifty. Is where we start to pray for the sick. I do not know the boy. I've never seen him. I'll turn my back to him as I talked to you about that thing this afternoon. Sir, I do not know him. If we are strangers, one another, raise up your hand. And I've never seen you in my life. No more than you've walked up here. And I've got my back to you. But to let the people, the congregation, see, if he will do it, that he is keeping his tongue. As he come in flesh things and manifested himself to Abraham, he comes into his flesh that he has redeemed and manifested himself to Abraham's seed. You understand that? Yeah. Now the God of heaven knows I know not the man. Now, I take every... Here he is. He's here now. I take every spirit out in you under my control. In the name of Jesus Christ. That pillar of fire that you see in the picture... He isn't too close to where I'm standing now. Now, let the man which is behind me 
Just pray to the Lord. Whatever's wrong. He might be sick. He might have financial troubles. I, I don't know. Whatever it is, let the Holy Spirit prove the Word of God right here before you. My God of heaven, it's in your arms, in your hands. I'm just your servant. Let it be known that you're God. And I'm telling your message true and clean. I've honored you, Lord, and I honor the word that I have preached. I commit myself to you in the name of Jesus Christ. But these people might know that you are God and I'm your God. A man standing behind me is not praying for himself. He's praying for somebody else. And that's a child. The child isn't here. The child is suffering with a rupture. If you believe with all your heart, the rupture shall leave the child. Does that say he's right? If it is, raise up your hand. <laughs> then go and believe and just keep watching that. <laughs> I want to talk to you, your woman. Jesus met a woman at the well one time. This is our first time meeting, I suppose, in life. We do not know each other. This, you're a lot younger than I. We were probably born miles apart, years apart. And here's our first time meeting. Now, Jesus met a woman one time. I am not he, neither are you she. But that his word might be fulfilled. So let the people see that, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody in the audience. Something happened in the audience. I have to just follow it. It's a, I see the light and it's a vision. It just moves out. I do not know you as I say. And Jesus met a woman in a little panoramic like this. And he spoke to her a few minutes to find the secret of her heart. And he told her what her trouble was. And she said quickly, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when Messiah comes, he'll tell us these things. Jesus said, I'm here to speak. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who's told me what was all, what the things that she did. Said, Isn't that the very Messiah? Now, lady, this afternoon, me not knowing you, you're not knowing me or I. Then, if the Holy Spirit remains the same that was in Jesus as in us, because God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, He was the Son of God, and we we're adopted sons and daughters of God. And if he will tell me something that you have done, something that you planned on doing, something that you're here for, or sickness, or, or somebody you want to be prayed for, or something, would it make you believe and you have faith? Would the rest of the audience believe? Do you know the woman, anybody? I don't think by your Christian. Because I feel your vibration of your spirit. You're a Christian. Believe me. You have nothing to worry about. Just be humble. Believe one thing you're suffering with is a nervous condition. You're extremely nervous. That is right. And you have a lady's trouble, a uh, female trouble, drop glands. That's true. I didn't guess that. I was trying to find where I come from. I did not guess that. That's no guess. That's truth. Is that truth, lady? Raise your hand. Let me see. I don't even know what I said. The only way I know is catch the tape. That's anointing. You're in another world. Another dimension. Yes, here she comes. I see her. Especially, it's a nervous condition. She suffers with it, especially late of the evening when she's real tired. She gets real weary then. And yes, I see the examination shows she had a, a lady's trouble. That's right. She also, she has uh, a gallbladder condition. And she has heart trouble. It's a nervous heart. Those things are true, aren't they? That's right. Somebody else she wants to be healed too, isn't it? It's her husband? sitting right out here and you believe God can tell me what's wrong with him? If I will, you think he would accept it as his healing? 
You would? Then the asthmatic condition will leave you. <laughs> Don't leave now. Don't die. Jesus Christ will make you well. God bless you. You believe with all your heart now? Just have faith. Don't down. How do you do? Way back there in the back, sitting back there, the lady suffering with gallstones. It left you then, lady, so you can go and be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. I don't know you. We are strangers to one another. If God will explain to me what your trouble is, will you believe me to be his servant and believe that he lives? I want to say this thing to you. You're, you're aware that something's going on. A real sweet humble feeling. If that's right, raise up your hands so the audience can see it. I'm looking right at this light. If you brother here at see, look between me and her. See I have an emerald colored light moving. I hear the woman moves away from me. Yes, she's got a growth. And the growth is on the left side of the breast, under the left breast. That's thus saith the Lord. Amen. Believe on it with all your heart. You can be healed. You have faith you believe with all your heart? Don't doubt now. Just have faith. Say, I do believe. <laughs> Having headaches, aren't you? You have a prayer card? Yeah. You don't need it no more. I don't know you. If that's right, raise up your hand. What did you touch? I asked you, what did she touch? She's 20 feet from me or 30. She never touched me. But she touched that high priest that can be touched by the feeling of her infirmities. That's the reason she can be healed because she believes. I challenge you to believe it. Watch what happens. This the lady that... How do you do, lady? We are strangers to each other, too, I suppose. God knows us both. Is that right? You believe that God knows both of us? Well, are you speaking Norwegian? Anybody German? Or is that German? Do you speak German now? We are strangers to each other. No, if you say it to her. I do not know. Hi. That's all right. Listen. I watch the vision. Can you say vision? If I see this, tell her her trouble, where she believes. If I, she wants, she wants to see her. Is she, you speak German? Yeah. All right, just a moment. Yeah. See what the vision is. Now you have to catch it real quick because it leads me. Now you just say what I say. Be so sure if you say it in German. If God will reveal to me what you're here for, will you believe me to be His servant? If so, raise up your hand. You suffer. Catch this now. Wait, I catch it again. Let's catch it in the because I have to say it just as a thief. She was I'd right on, but it's the vision left me just a moment. She's got stomach trouble. And from a nervous condition. 
A nervous condition causes a stomach trouble. How would I know that when I can't even speak your own language? God reveals it to me. There's something on your heart. You want somebody else to pray for? It's your husband. It's in his ears. He isn't here. But if you'll believe, now she's understanding English. Now you can go and receive it in Jesus' name. Forget what you ask for. Now, how about that? <laughs> See, when the uh, divine interpretation comes, she fell into the channel. It would come, I thought maybe it would do it, so you might see that God can make you understand any kind of language you want to. And while I was in the vision, not knowing what I was speaking, she understood it in English saying. See, there it was. Oh, isn't he real? Now, that is our Lord Jesus, who is the same yesterday and forever. Just put your hand on mine. You believe with all your heart. Then the diabetes will leave you and you can go home be well. <laughs> when you were standing there speaking for me, you've been crippling around with arthritis. You couldn't hardly get up at morning. I've had a hard time. That's what made me in between the vision. You had so much faith you was pulling it from that woman all the time. That arthritis you've been having, forget it. Go on. You're going to be all right and be well. God makes you well. Well, the back, all right now, you can go home, be well. Jesus Christ, be well. Now, didn't you feel real good when I said that? Because you had the same thing and you were healed at the same time. Let's say praise be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. And the same thing again. I'll say a back condition, praise the Lord, go believe with all your heart. Now, you suffer with a nervous condition, son. Everybody will try and tell you, get next to yourself, but you can't. If something scares you, where is you? I'm not reading your mind, but you couldn't hide your life now if you had to, you see. But you've been trying to find a place where you get stuck. Say, from right here, I'll start. From here. Is that right? You're on the place right now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The nervousness will leave you. Go and be well in the name of Jesus Christ. You're facing an operation from a tumor. You believe that God can heal the tumor? Take it off your shoulder and make you well? On your left shoulder. Go and believe, and it'll leave you. Let's say praise the Lord. Arthritis. You believe with all your heart he'll make you well and heal you? Go, having faith in God, and God will grant it to you. Now, when you come up here a few moments ago, and I had to call you, you were a little weary. I didn't want you to be weary, because a person with heart trouble should never be weary. But you don't have it no more now. Jesus makes you well, so just go on your knees. Do you believe out there with all your heart? What about the lady sitting here with bare cross veins looking at me? Do you believe that God will make you well, lady? You accept it? Raise up your hand if that's right. Believe it. Have faith in God. The lady sitting back there with trouble with her leg, do you believe God will heal the limb and make you well? If you believe it, just accept it and say, thanks be to God, you can have it. I challenge every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to believe that that's God showing the Son. He's still Messiah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe it? Raise up your hand. Now, I'm going to quote you his word. Here's what he said. Now, he's present. I cannot do those things. I'm getting weak. I just can barely see you now. See? Because it's just fading out. If one of those... A woman touched his garment and what taken place, how what do you think would do... Him, the Son of God, and me, a sinner saved by grace. Daniel saw one vision was trouble at his head for many days. Is that right, brother? And it gets you to a spot where, and I'm weak anyhow from six months of going. Now he's here. The Christ of God is here. Is there one here that hasn't been a believer until this time? We want to raise our hands and say, Brother Branham, pray for me. I now believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart and accept him as my Savior. God bless you back there, lady. Would there be another? God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you back there. Down to the middle aisle. I am now in the presence of a risen Christ who I'll stand before today at judgment. 
Remember, you will stand before the very Spirit that you're now at the Day of Judgment to give an account for what you've done this afternoon. Will you receive Him? Will you receive Him? Anybody in this left aisle down here, so raise up your hand and say, I've been a church member. I have never really been born again. I don't know what it means to be a full consecrated Christian, but now I consecrate my life to Him. I want to be a Christian while His presence is here. And no, you say, what is? The, how do I know? You know that's who's talking to you right now in your heart.